This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com, featuring Stephanie Link, who shares her investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights with Action Alerts Plus, the multi million dollar portfolio she manages with Jim Kramer. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Heading to the Hill, General Motors says it will take a massive recall-related charge in the first quarter. The announcement comes a day before its CEO faces Congress. How did GM get to this point, and what happens next? I think this extraordinary commitment is still needed and will be for some time. And with those words from Janet Yellen about the Federal Reserve's low-rate policy, stocks took off, closing out the quarter with a triple-digit gain on the Dow. Cutting cholesterol, a new and promising weapon in the fight against cardiovascular disease and the drug makers behind it. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, March 31st. Good evening, everyone. The devastating problems at General Motors have gotten a whole lot worse. GM now expects to take a massive $750 million charge this quarter for the cost of recalling and repairing a million and a half cars with faulty ignition switches. Now, that comes on top of a new recall for more than 1.3 million cars that may see a sudden loss of power steering and another recall late Friday of half a million trucks and SUVs for potential problems with transmission coolant lines. The automaker's new chief executive, Mary Barra, will try to repair GM's reputation tomorrow. That's when she testifies on Capitol Hill. Late today, Barra's prepared remarks were released, and she says the automaker holds itself fully accountable for the safety defects, but says can't say why it took so long to identify them. With families of the victims expected at Tuesday's hearing, look for tense and emotional testimony in the House. Meanwhile, on Wall Street, GM stock fell nearly 1 percent. It's down almost 16 percent this year. Here's Eamon Javers with a timeline of the troubles at GM. What did General Motors know and when did the automaker know it? Those are the questions being asked about a faulty ignition switch that has led to at least 13 deaths. Answers are emerging from documents released from the automaker and from Congress. In 2001, GM first became aware that there was a serious problem with select vehicles. In 2002, auto parts supplier Delphi, which makes the ignition switch, said GM approved the part knowing it didn't meet their specifications. In 2003, a dealer technician also observed the car stall after the ignition had switched off while driving. These dates are in stark contrast to what the automaker first claimed, that they only knew of the defect in 2004. Fast forward 10 years to February 2014, GM under new CEO Mary Barra issues a recall for over one and a half million vehicles, sparking regulators to launch a formal investigation. This month, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration demanded detailed answers to 107 questions to determine if GM properly followed the legal processes and requirements for reporting recalls. And just last Friday, GM added almost a million vehicles to the recall, now totaling more than 2.5 million worldwide. Tomorrow, Barra will be on Capitol Hill. The big question, why did it take so long for General Motors to recall vehicles that had a faulty part, leading to at least 13 deaths? And where were the regulators all this time? For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eamon Javers in Washington. Joining us more to talk uh, now to talk more about GM is Colin Langan. He's an auto analyst with UBS. Mr. Langan, welcome. Good to have you with us. Yeah. Apart from the uh, moral or ethical uh, uh, dilemmas presented by these cases, uh, what overall is your estimate of the total cost of resolving uh, this situation for General Motors, specifically the ignition uh, defect? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, overall right now, I mean, they just announced uh, after the close today that there's about a $750 million impact uh, for the, the actual repairs. Uh, the, act the ignition is actually probably only uh, a very small portion of that. It was really more the subsequent recalls that were impacting that. I think the, the other major piece of this puzzle that we'll, we'll see out over the probably the next year or so uh, will be the potential uh, you know, investigation from the Department of Justice. Uh, if you looked at the recent uh, settlement for uh, criminal penalties with Toyota, 
Toyota, it was $1.2 billion. Uh, that was all about the timeliness of notifying uh, the regulatory agencies. Uh, GM will probably face a similar risk because uh, of the delay in reporting these issues. Colin, how do you think Mary Barrow is going to do tomorrow on Capitol Hill? She's uh, already apologized. She says she wants to do the right thing. Um, do you think that she can do anything to repair GM's reputation tomorrow in front of lawmakers? Um, I think she has a you know tough, tough job ahead of her, but I think she's done a very good job so far. I think she's been very open, uh, very responsive as much as they can be as they're continuing the investigation. Uh, but you know she'll be facing a lot of tough questions tomorrow, and uh, you know quite frankly it doesn't sound like they have all of the answers yet. Uh, but I think they're you know doing a very good job of communicating openness and responsiveness, and and really being very apologetic, which I think is very important at this point in terms of managing the long-term brand impact here. Colin, the uh, current General Motors is inoculated by its bankruptcy filing from legal liability for incidents that occurred before 2009. But there are reports today that General Motors may set up a sort of reimbursement fund uh, of, its, of the current company, giving money back to the stub or the bankrupt estate. Uh, have you heard anything about that? And, and what do you think of that as a way to make things, if not right, at least better? Um, I mean, it's clearly an option. I mean, I think what you said is mostly correct. I mean, they, since any incidents that occurred before bankruptcy, which is a majority of the incidents, as, you know, as far as we know, uh, they would not be legally liable for. So this would really be, um, you know, GM trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, we'll see, you know, when or if they make that kind of announcement that, you know, could come, you know, with a coordination with the Department of Justice settlement or something like that. But, you know, it's clearly a, a possibility uh, that they could do something like that. You know, there are so many question marks and issues, uncertainty hanging over General Motors, and yet, uh, from the investment point of view, you still like the stock. Tell us why you like it at $34, and I understand you got a $51 price target on it. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the stock, it's been down about 9% ever since the recall news uh, happened. You know, that's about $5.5 billion of its market cap, uh, though if you look at actual, the actual costs are probably going to be less than $2 billion. So, you know, I do think there's a bit of an overreaction. And quite frankly, we like the stock, you know, uh, quite a bit uh, before the recall news. So, you know, I think over the next few months, you'll probably see a bit of an impact on their market share. But, you know, I think they're handling it well. Uh, none of the current products are, are affected by the ignition recall. Uh, so I do think their share will bounce back uh, in a couple months, and I think they'll be back on track since uh, they do have an awful lot of new products this year. Colin, in the grand scheme of things, are these subsequent recalls, the ones after the ignition switch problem, are they bigger and more costly in some, in some ways? Uh, yeah, in my opinion, they're probably actually more costly recalls. Uh, the actual ignition, uh, you know, according to you know other companies, is around only the part itself is only two to five dollars. Labor mm -hmm. cost is actually probably low. Um, it's really the you know depends on the complexity. Some of the other recalls are a little bit more complicated. I think what GM is trying to do is you know make sure that there's just no additional uh, recall headlines lingering throughout the rest of the year. So, and I also think they're you know trying and, and actually being responsive to any potential issues to show that they're they really are trying to right. change the way they've act. Uh, relative to, to their history. Colin, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Colin Langan is an auto analyst with UBS. Right. Thank you very much. On Wall Street, investors can thank Janet Yellen for closing out the first quarter on a high note. The Federal Reserve chief made some reassuring comments today about keeping interest rates at record low levels for some time to come. The Nasdaq and the S&P ended the quarter with gains, a different story for the blue chip Dow stocks. They were up for March, but were down nearly 1 percent for the first three months of 2014. Here's a look at today's closing numbers. The Dow surged 134 points, the Nasdaq rose 43, and the S&P added 4 14 points, and it's just six points shy of its all-time high. More now on Janet Yellen's market-moving comments and her willingness to show a different, more woman-of-the-people style to market watchers. Steve Leisman reports. Following her speech in which she suggested the Fed will keep its easy monetary policy in place, new Fed chair Janet Yellen did what no Fed chair has likely done before her put on a welder's mask as she toured a jobs training facility. I'm demonstrating a uh, bowling pin here. It's all part of a promise Yellen gave in her confirmation hearing in the fall. She said she would never forget that there were ordinary Americans behind the statistics. It also appears to be part of an effort by the Fed to ensure that its efforts to steward the economy, which became highly controversial during the financial crisis, have some popular support. In her speech earlier today, Yellen took a page out of the politician's playbook mentioning ordinary people, like a woman who had been unemployed for a long time. That's what Doreen Poole learned after she lost her job processing medical insurance claims just as the recession was getting started. 
Like many others, she couldn't find any job, despite clerical skills and experience acquired over 15 years of steady employment. Her predecessor, Ben Bernanke, pioneered the idea, among other things, teaching college courses on monetary policy throughout the country. But Yellen seems to be embracing the technique right from the beginning and in a more down-home way. Yellen, of course, also made news on monetary policy. I think this extraordinary commitment is still needed and will be for some time. And I believe this view is widely shared by my fellow policymakers at the Fed. That sent stocks higher and bond yields lower because it meant the Fed could keep interest rates lower for longer. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. And still ahead, Apple versus Samsung, one of the fiercest corporate rivalries, heads back to court. But in this fight, Google may have the most at stake. This is it, deadline day to sign up for a new health care plan under the Affordable Care Act. That's in time for coverage to kick in by May 1. And, well, today didn't go so well. With so many last-minute hopefuls trying to enroll in the new plan before midnight, the federalhealthcare.gov website did what it has done previous times. It crashed. It crashed several times with officials working hard to fix it and reopen the marketplace to get more people signed up. Even so, with so many Americans signed up for a new plan and more likely to enroll today, a lot of the nation's health insurance companies have already benefited from the Affordable Care Act. And as Bertha Coombs explains, they may even have more to look forward to. By noon, the healthcare.gov site saw 1.2 million visitors, a crush of last-minute enrollees, after a big push by the Obama administration with appeals from the president on talk shows and social media to get young people to sign up for coverage. Certainly a big part of the push of the last several weeks has been aimed at them. Everybody wants to get them into the pool. For health insurers, a larger mix of healthy young people lowers the risk that the industry will lose money on Affordable Care Act plans. The whole numbers game for them is determining what do these new members look like, how much are they going to cost us in terms of medical care, and how do we factor that into our pricing for next year. The nation's largest insurance firm on the exchanges, WellPoint, has been optimistic about its profit outlook. Others, like Aetna, more cautious. But investors have been bullish on the sector. While the S&P rose just over 1 percent year-to-date, insurers gained nearly 7 percent. And analysts say the stocks will likely see more gains. It looks like the insurers have priced their insurance business correctly, which means that there is probably some upside in terms of earnings potential for the rest of the year. Another positive for insurance earnings, the Medicare Advantage program. Proposed rate cuts look like they'll be lower than some had estimated. Given that we're going into a midterm election year, I would be surprised if there would be draconian cuts in any aspect of health care. Final Medicare Advantage rates will be released in early April, but final ACA enrollment numbers may not come for a while, with people experiencing glitches on sites being given up to two more weeks to complete their applications. Bertha Coombs, Nightly Business Report. More health news you should know about an experimental class of cholesterol-lowering drugs is showing a lot of promise for up to 70 million Americans suffering from heart-related illnesses. And it could generate $3 billion in annual sales for the companies racing to get those new medications to market. Dominic Chu has the details. The American Heart Association says that cardiovascular disease kills more Americans than any other disease out there. And high cholesterol is one of the biggest risk factors. For decades, fighting high cholesterol has been about taking statin drugs. You know them by their brand names, like AstraZeneca's Crestor, Bristol-Myers Provacol, and of course Merck's Zocor and Pfizer's Lipitor. Well, if you suffer from high cholesterol, there's a new kind of drug that may be in your future. Instead of statin chemicals, these new drugs are protein-based. Statins work on curbing the liver's production of cholesterol. These new drugs work on helping the liver remove cholesterol from the bloodstream. 
and companies like Amgen, Sanofi, Regeneron, and even Pfizer are working on them. But there's a catch. Statins are usually pills taken orally, and they're cheaper because generic versions are typically available. These new drugs are meant to be taken as periodic injections, possibly using something along the lines of an EpiPen. They could also cost a lot more than traditional statin medications. While the concept is generating positive chatter in medical circles, many more tests will need to be done before it can be determined if these drugs actually help reduce the risk of heart attacks. The question is uh, whether in long-term outcome studies, uh, the reductions in cholesterol that are being reported actually translate into lower rates of heart attack and a lower incidence of stroke. So there's a lot at stake, not just for the big drug companies, but also the millions of Americans combating high cholesterol. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. And more health news here. Johnson & Johnson accepts a $4 billion offer for its blood testing unit, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Private equity firm Carlisle Group made a bid for the unit back in January, and Johnson & Johnson had until today to agree to the deal. The transaction is expected to close mid-year. J&J shares edged up a fraction to $98.23. Bill Ackman's firm, Pershing Square, upped its stake in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to more than 11 percent. The activist investor is now the largest shareholder in both of these government-sponsored mortgage lending giants. Shares of both companies surged about 9 percent. Fannie Mae closed at $3.89, Freddie Mac at $3.87. Soda sales losing their fizz. Americans cut back on soda at a faster pace last year. And then in many years, that according to a new report, and even diet soda sales are declining. This is the ninth straight year of declines for soft drink sales overall. Shares of Coke off a fraction to $38.66. PepsiCo up a little bit, $83.50, the close for that one. Disney's hit movie Frozen has become the top grossing animated film in box office history. The musical topped a billion dollars in global sales. The impressive number surpasses uh, the mark that Disney's other big movie, Toy Story 3, set back in 2010. Shares of Disney up nearly 1.5% to $80.07. Two titans of the tech world, Apple and Samsung, in court again today. This time, they're battling over patented technology used in each other's smartphones. But as Morgan Brennan reports, it's Google that could have the most at stake in this legal scuffle. Apple and Samsung are at it again, facing off in court for the second time in two years over patents. The new case revolving around design elements and features used in the company's smartphones, with both alleging that their patents have been infringed. But there's a third company that's got a lot to lose as well, and that's Google. While not named in the case, it's Google's technology that's in question, specifically its Android operating system. Everyone expects Samsung to, uh, to argue here that you know four of these patents that are Apple's asserting against it, um, it licensed from Android, and, that, and they expect um, the Google software engineers to testify that they had begun development of these features before Apple. Android is used in over a billion devices worldwide, including Samsung products like the popular Galaxy line. So features like the ability to tap a phone number inside a text message and then call it, one of the patents in question, were created for the Android system by Google, not Samsung. Apple could collect as much as $2 billion in damages if the court, which hears the case over the next month, rules in its favor. But that's a drop in the bucket for the $480 billion market cap company. Instead, the bigger issue is future market share, which Apple has already been ceding to Samsung. Last year, Samsung was the market leader with one of every three smartphones sold. Apple, with its higher priced phones, was second. So a win for Apple could impact Samsung's devices and the technology Google has created for them, forcing changes that could push up costs. Suddenly you could see that they're not able to sell certain things they might want to sell, or if they're able to sell them, they're going to actually have to pay Apple a royalty to do so. So the pricing goes up, and guess what? It's more dollars in Apple's pocket. Still, questions linger over the legality of software patents, whether they are written too generally and the circumstances under which they can be upheld. It's a topic just heard in a separate case today by the Supreme Court, and one that legal experts say Apple and Samsung's face-off could help decide. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan in Los Angeles. 
Caterpillar avoided paying more than $2 billion in U.S. taxes since the year 2000. That's according to a congressional report that says the manufacturing company used an aggressive tax strategy to shift profits overseas. A hearing will be held on the issue tomorrow. John Harwood joins us now from Washington. So, John, tell us, uh, you know, what's the goal of tomorrow's hearing? Well, uh, Carl Levin, the chairman of the committee, has been working with Republicans, John McCain and among others, to shine a light on uh, tax avoidance by American corporations, usually perfectly legal tax avoidance, but what, things that uh, uh, he regards as loopholes that should be closed. And he's going to try to spotlight some of those with the Caterpillar problems. He's making the argument, and their subcommittee did an investigation that showed that Caterpillar spent about $55 million dollars uh, on advice from PricewaterhouseCoopers that allowed it to avoid those $2.4 in taxes. And the uh, uh, subcommittee is, wants to argue that the IRS needs to tighten up on this. Congress needs to, although that's very difficult to get anything through the Congress, given how divided it is right now. So I guess you would say that there, there's low odds that this will lead to any kind of tax reform. Tax reform is going to be very difficult. You know, uh, both champions of tax reform, the people I interviewed in 2013 who said that they were going to each pass a, a, a piece of legislation in their chamber, Max Baucus is now the ambassador to China. Uh, he uh, quit his Senate seat. And Dave Camp, the Republican chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, just announced today he's retiring for con from Congress. And that just tells you that the uh, outlook is very bleak for any kind of bipartisan tax reform. You know, John, for years, uh, a lot of uh, people, lawmakers in Washington, have been trying to get companies to bring their profits made overseas to the U.S. and invest that money here. Is this at all connected to that whole push? Yes. And what the committee is arguing is that a shell uh, subsidiary was created in Switzerland that didn't have any real business function, but was solely for the purpose of parking profits there that would not have to come back to the United States and have taxes paid on them. Uh, so th this is a continuing issue. Both parties don't like it. Both parties have raised questions about it, although their solutions are different. Uh, and I do think even though the near-term outlook for corporate tax reform is bleak, over the longer run, this is accelerating a conversation that will probably play out over the next several years in Congress. And who knows, maybe, uh, maybe with in uh, five or six years, something will get done. John Harwood from a very nice looking nation's capital tonight, where it was snowing yesterday when I was down there. John, good to see you. And coming up on the program, the banking industry has undergone some big changes since the financial crisis. But what other transformations are in store? We'll hear predictions from some banking industry leaders. And finally tonight, the financial crisis is behind us now, and the nation's big banks have a laundry list of new regulations aimed at making sure the sector is safer than it was before. So what might the future of the banking world look like? Kayla Tausche takes a look. Four years after the Dodd-Frank banking reform bill was passed in Washington, much about the way large financial institutions are run has changed. New capital standards mean banks have more cash on hand and are largely insulated from major downturns in the market. In response, Wall Street's fled from risky investments, like the subprime mortgages that brought the U.S. financial system to its knees. I think the financial system of the country is a lot stronger and safer and sounder today than it was in the fall of 08 when we began this process. But many former policymakers still feel that Wall Street hasn't changed enough. It's these very large uh, institutions that are highly interconnected, huge derivatives books. I, that is a key, uh, key problem, but too big to fail. The Federal Reserve's latest round of stress tests may have borne that out. Citigroup, the country's third largest bank by total assets, failed on a straightforward mark, auditing. Barney Frank, co-architect of the Dodd-Frank reform bill, says that might not be a bad thing. The bar, he says, is high. And it shows that they have been uh, led by the, by the rules to uh, toughen themselves up. And even Citi, although they didn't get everything they wanted in terms of dividends, et cetera, uh, was in better shape than it would have been years ago. 
And new technologies also mean new hurdles for regulators. Innovations in online banking and payments bring new threats. Cybersecurity now seen as one of the major challenges for the industry today. That is a, a major uh, challenge both for the industry and for the regulators to make sure that our uh, banking system is uh, resilient in the face of these threats. Even as Washington works to protect consumers, regulation always has unintended consequences. It's going so far that it's beginning to impede upon their ability to focus on innovation, strategy, business operations, and all the other elements that are necessary for leaders and board of directors to properly uh, guide and steward a business. Here at the Future of National Banking Conference, attendees have expressed mixed feelings about just how effective this wealth of new regulation will be. One thing both sides agree on, we won't know for sure until the next financial crisis. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche in Boston. Do we really need another financial crisis to solve these problems? I hope, I hope not. not. I hope not. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrow. Thanks so much for watching. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll hope to see you back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Founded by Jim Cramer, TheStreet.com is an independent source for stock market analysis. Cramer's Action Alerts Plus is home to his multi-million dollar portfolio. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. The troubles at General Motors got worse today. It now expects a $750 million charge for the cost of recalling and repairing one and a half million faulty ignition switches that have been linked to a dozen deaths. That's on top of a new recall of 1.3 million cars for a power steering problem. Stocks got a boost from Fed Chair Janet Yellen, reassuring Wall Street that interest rates will stay at record low levels for some time to come. The Dow surged 134 points points, ending the month higher, but down nearly 1 percent for the quarter. The Nasdaq rose 43 points. The S&P added 14 points. And Disney's hit movie Frozen has become the top-grossing animated film in box office history. The musical topped $1 billion in global sales. Be sure to tune in to Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.